Because this is a big one for for women. It's like, they're like, but I haven't done the full thing in my goal list. I can't write that down as an accomplishment. And it's like, no, a win is any small measure of progress that you have made, right? Cool. Josie, welcome to Money Bites. Hi, it's great to be here. Super excited. Uh, Could you do a one-liner intro of yourself? Sure. So I am an engineering leader turned executive and leadership coach for women in tech. What does that mean? So I help women leaders in the tech industry figure out how to thrive. So 50% of us end up leaving the tech industry by the age of 35. And my mission is let's retain women in tech instead of having them leave. That is an awesome mission. What's the number one reason why women leave. So it's interesting because a lot of people assume that it's to go start a family, right? Because around the age of 35, you might be going to start a family. And while that is one of the reasons, the top reason is actually unfair treatment, right? They're, they're tired of dealing with bias. They're tired of the, the, the microaggressions, the, the small things that happen on a daily basis that, that end up just making you feel isolated, alone, and whether you should really be in this industry. Would you say there is the most effective way to address this? Uh, what might that be? So I think one of the most effective ways to address this is by focusing on inclusion. I think a lot of companies start with, let's focus on diversity. But the problem with that is then you end up having the revolving door we have in the tech industry today. And when it's when I say starting with inclusion, it really is the onus is on the leadership, right? So um, I talk about the empathetic management framework and the first phase is really leaders realizing how to become more inclusive leaders themselves, right? Realizing unconscious bias is a thing that happens, right? Let's let's not try to blame people for it or, or, or come at it from a place of blame, but really coming at it from the perspective of, we, 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 you know, the reason we can drive without thinking every three seconds how to drive is because our brain has short circuits, right, that, that help us do things efficiently. But it also can lead us to have biases. And so it's like, where do we need to slow down our thinking? Where do we need to be more intentional around these things. The second is how do we then incorporate these into our ways of working on a day to day basis. And commonly, so many companies have, you know, a nice set of core values that are posted up on their wall or their internet, and they really get looked at once every six months at performance review time, potentially. But if we have values tied to inclusion and we're actually integrating them into our ways of working, how can we make meetings more inclusive? For example, how do we, you know, make sure that everyone's getting a chance to participate? You know, how do we ensure the right people are being invited to the meetings and you're actually getting diverse viewpoints in the meetings? How do you make sure that everybody's ideas are being heard and recognized? And I think it has to start with this recognition that like, hey, we're also human beings, we're not perfect, right? But let's create a workspace where we can bring up when we see things happen, right? Um, Kim Scott recently re-released her book, uh, Just Work, and they called it Radical Respect. And it really talks about this, right? She talks about the fact that in, a, in any meeting that you pop into, most likely at least one biased thing happens in any meeting you pop into potentially, right? And yet we haven't really normalized being able to say like, hey, like, did that bias thing just happen? Like, can we talk about that and address it? Um, and and so I think it's really about like, what are those little things we can do and things that in places we go every day, like meetings, right? I really appreciate the fact that you are surfacing, like how to quantify DEI and also the emphasis that it's not just about diversity. Because even for myself as a woman in tech, I think I tend to think about the qualitative aspects first, which makes me feel sometimes voiceless when I want to <laughs> want to try to um, 
request changes because it, it seems very cultural, exactly to your point. I noticed though, this is coming, or rather this mission is coming mm-hmm. from some personal experiences that you've had. Mm-hmm. There were instances when um, looking at your life satisfaction graph, when your personal life was uh, impacted, but also your career satisfaction was impacted. Was there a particular triggering moment when you decided I'm going to go from Eng at a very successful career to try to actually do something about this? So it's been something that, you know, I, I'd been thinking about over a, a long time in my career. So, but the story really starts in late, in, sorry, in early 2018 when I left Apple. And at that point, I was feeling burnt out, even though I had had a successful time at Apple. You know, I had left feeling a lot of imposter syndrome. I actually thought I was an awful manager, despite the fact that I had t- t- coworkers tell me I was the best manager I'd ever had. I had felt my bucket of like microaggressions overflow and was just like, I'm done with this industry. I am, I don't want to do this again. I was about to become part of the statistic. And I gave myself six months off, which was like the first time I'd really given myself like a long time to take off in my career. And I realized a few things. First, I really focused on myself, on my self care. I got into journaling and meditating and like really reflecting on like, what is it that Josie wants? And I realized one, I love technology. I've been playing with computers since I was five years old and I had a Commodore 64 and I didn't want to leave tech, but I also wanted to do tech under my own rules. And so in late 2018, when I went to join Tile full time, I spoke with the new CEO and I said, look, if you want me to join Tile, I I want to lead your DEI efforts on top of being your platform engineering director. I I want to start the mentoring program. I was not allowed to start at Apple. And I want to make sure that inclusion isn't just lip service. And he surprised me. And he actually said, I promised my wife and daughters to make Tile the best place for women to work in the Valley. So I joined and like, we really delivered on that promise. And I say we, because it wasn't just me and the CEO, like it's a group effort to actually make an inclusive culture. I just had this realization afterwards where I was like, I've done this and I don't want to just be doing this one company at a time. So that's why in July of 2022, I said, I really want to start my own business and figure out like, how do we retain more women in the tech industry? What was the scariest thing about starting your company? I think the uncertainty of it. I think even though ultimately you could get laid off or fired from any job, and especially with the uncertainty in tech these days, There is so much more uncertainty in running your own business, right? Like there is no guarantee of a paycheck showing up every month. There is, I I tell people starting your own business is like the biggest personal development journey that I have ever been (laughs) on because no one's really telling you what to do. You really are stepping into like, you are the CEO, the, 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 there is nobody above you that you can ask questions to like the buck stops here, right? Like, and it can be really easy to get into like a negative mindset or get into this place of worry and limiting beliefs and, and learning to really embrace the uncertainty instead of trying to run away from it. Do you feel or rather What has been the most surprising as you try to scale? So as I've been scaling, one of the big things for me has been the reason I'm doing this on top of my mission, right, is I want to slow down. I want to create a more easeful life. I do not want to be in meetings eight hours a day, and then working afterwards, right? Like this part of doing this has really been like, how do I build and scale my business, not just so I am helping other people, but also doing it in a way that really resonates with like, 
I want to go lay out on my hammock in the middle of the afternoon for an hour and read. And like, I can do that. And so I think it's really been realizing that you have so much more ability to figure out how to craft the business that you want, but it's almost a double-edged sword in some ways because there are so many options. It can be very easy to fall into either shiny object syndrome or just get into paralysis around, oh, do I do this or do I do this? And then just like not make any forward progress. And so, you know, trying to architect that business that, you know, not only, you know, makes the impact I want in the world, but also provides me the the lifestyle I want, like that just has to be a constant reminder for myself of like my why, right? And it's like, I want to really get to live my dream life, right? And and I truly believe, you know, in the tech industry, I feel like sometimes we're sold this belief that success means, you know, we just keep going up the career ladder and we keep making more money. And not that those things are wrong, but we're, we're almost told that like, well, happiness comes at the end. Happiness comes like when you retire, like don't worry about that happiness thing right now, right? Worry about like the definition of success. And yet so often I run into so many women who've been doing this for 20 and 25 years and externally you look at their careers and they look insanely successful, but they're not happy. And so it's like, we can have both. We can have success and we can have happiness. And we also get to define what success looks like under our terms, not everybody else's. I, I love the fact that you are setting your own standards, etc. But when we look at your life satisfaction graph, there's also like three drops that um, you sort of persevered through. One was burnout. Another was family health mm-hmm. issues, etc. How did you overcome that? And did that sort of foray into your drive to find your own set of happiness? Earlier in my life, so about 10 years ago now, um, my mom passed away. And that had been a really hard period. My sister, uh, my half sister had passed away three months before my mom. Um, My dad was, my mom had struggled with Alzheimer's for eight years. And I was basically trying to take care of both my mom and my dad, who was also trying to take care of my mom, but he was struggling with his own mental health issues over the time. And so it was a really, like it was a like there was like a six-year period in my life that was really really hard for me and then afterwards my two years later my brother passed away as well so my both of my siblings passed away in their mid-60s my brother actually six months before he retired and one of the big things from like all of these life experiences has really been this realization that life is short, you don't know, like what's going to happen. And so my brother actually was was successful in his career, and always was living from the idea of, okay, I will enjoy life when I retire, I'm going to work really, really hard, and I am going to enjoy life when I retire. It was really, for me, like that was really impactful from thinking about like, okay, how can I start enjoying life? a little bit more now. And then, you know, even when like my mom passed away, like I spent the next year, like really helping my dad, and he finally turned a corner. And actually, now he's doing like the best health he's ever been in, in like his life, honestly, from, you know, from a happiness and mental health perspective. And so I almost felt like, okay, I spent the first 35 years of my life taking care of other people. Now I get to start taking care of myself. And so these have really been like big eye openers for like, okay, how do I take care of of myself? And then after I started my business, about nine months in, I ended up having some pretty big health struggles myself for a few months. And I realized like, I had been kind of like, I thought I was taking care of myself, but I had also been just ignoring like really doing the deep work that I needed to do around like, 
processing emotions, right? It's like, I was doing a lot of like the checkbox type items, but I hadn't really given myself the time to really process. Last, last summer, I ended up visiting one of my friends for a week. And like, I cried my eyes out for like three or four days, like while I was there. And I tell people like, that was like the best vacation I had had <laughs> in a really <laughs> long time. And it's like, they're like, you cried your eyes out for a week. And I'm like, yes, because I finally was able to process emotions that I had been holding in for years that I just hadn't allowed myself to go through. And so, like I said, this is why I said like running your own business is like one of the biggest personal development journeys because like there's nothing to pad you where you can kind of go hide in a corner and pretend like, oh, everything's okay. Like all of your limiting beliefs come out when you're trying to run your own business and it makes you like face these things. I can a thousand percent relate. Uh, running Winnie, it's been a constant inner monologue of who do I think I am, but also why can't I do this? <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I feel I have like multiple personalities <laughs> sometimes. So totally can relate. Wanted to also ask, you mentioned you've been actively investing so that you were able mm -hmm. to build that nest egg to fund um, not only your your business, but also um, allow your network to grow as you strike out on your own. When did you feel you had enough of a safety net to to take that jump? Or was it more driven by that mission? So that's an interesting question. And this is actually something that I, I speak to both my coach and my therapist about on a, on a somewhat regular basis. Because, you know, when I was growing up, you know, it's not that we were poor, but we definitely lived paycheck to paycheck, like money, like, money was tight, there were trade offs to be made, right? Like, I worked three jobs. Uh, when I was at Princeton, I it was very much like, I, I very much grew up with the mindset of, you know, money is a scarce resource, right? There is not an abundance of it. And so I most likely saved much more and still have the mindset of like, Oh my gosh, I have to have so much in my savings compared to, I know people who have a lot less in their savings and they're more, and they're happy to just like be risky out there and like put, you know, risk and knowing like, Hey, if I risk, like that also means like I can have great success too. Right. So this is actually something I, um, I internally have to, to stop myself sometimes because it's like, okay, like, but I am like, even if I'm not making as much right now as I was making in the corporate world, like an investment now could actually end up meaning I'm going to make three times as much or four times as much in a year or two. Right. And so it's really about being willing to also just kind of take that risk. So for me, I most likely got like way further in like the nest egg for me to feel comfortable to be like, okay, now I have a nice big enough nest egg that I can now go do this. Um, but it's also like, I think people have different levels of like where they feel comfortable at. But I think again, it's one of those things to really need to be reflecting on yourself and saying like, where is this feeling coming from, right? Like, is it that I, because sometimes there's never enough money to make you feel truly safe. And that's where the self-trust and the self-worth really has to come in, which is I trust myself to make thoughtful decisions. I can't control the future. And I feel like I have now I have set myself up enough aside to to have, you know, a nice retirement. And if things go poorly, I trust myself that I could land a job if I needed to get back into the corporate world again, or, you know, I'm never going to be left like with nothing, right? I would not let myself get to that point. And even if I did get to that point, I can pick myself back up 
again. And right, it's really about truly building that trust more so than a number level at the end of the day. I find it super interesting because your your source of trust is also coming from your self-confidence in your skill set, it sounds like. And it's something that I've been thinking a lot as well in terms of how do I keep my skill set relevant the older that I get? But Mm -hmm. I love how you're flipping that into the self-confidence of being able to stay active. Before we close out, there's two things that I do want to ask, though. One is Mm -hmm. on the topic of trust, I feel... Sometimes women in allies are so, I don't want to say injustices, but like little stabs, like you mentioned, that mm-hmm. it doesn't register. How, what would be your advice on picking up, oh, this is actually not right versus this is something that can be passed. It's not an issue. Um, there was a great Harvard Business Review article and actually Rishma Shajani did a keynote speak, speech last year at Smith College on this topic that we should stop telling women they have imposter syndrome. And um, the, the concept is around the fact that, yes, obviously imposter syndrome is a thing, right? But for First, by even just calling it imposter syndrome, it's like it is already making women feel like I am the outsider. You're saying I am an imposter, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then the other thing is women feel like it is something they are responsible for. Whereas, in fact, imposter syndrome is a societal issue that needs to be addressed by corporations, by leaders, like, and and figuring out how to create systems that overcome this. And so, and so then it can really, as, as you know, as a woman, you can really, really easy to sometimes dismiss like, oh, that was that was that really bias or was that just me? Right. And it can to get taken to the extreme too, where then you also take no self responsibility and are, are always in the victim mode. Right. And so I think there's, there's a spectrum of like never taking responsibility to taking all the responsibility mm-hmm. that can happen for really anybody. And so I think first of all, it's about realizing like, yes, these things happen and trusting in yourself. And so how do you start building trust in yourself? It's well, start collecting evidence. So I have all the women I coach create success journals, right? It's your it's your wins journal. So on a daily or weekly basis, like write down your wins, right? What are and a win doesn't mean because this is a big one for for women. It's like, they're like, but I haven't done the full thing in my goal list. I can't write that down as an accomplishment. And it's like, no, a win is any small measure of progress that you have made, right? And so often, we're not celebrating our wins along the way. And so self trust and building our self worth really comes down to accepting like, So there's this great book that was released earlier this year called Worthy um, from uh, Jamie Carlina. And she really talks about the difference between self-confidence and self-worth. And self-confidence is really those things that we build from those external accomplishments, right? Like we see those wins along the way. Self-worth is really like the foundation of the house, right? Self-worth is coming to the acceptance of no matter if I don't ac- accomplish anything else in my life, I am worthy just for being me, for just being the unique human individual that I am on this planet because I was brought, you know, I am here for a reason. And it's about really building that foundation of self worth under the self confidence because that's what helps us through peaks and valleys, right? Through through successes and through challenges that come in our life. And so it, it's really taking the time to also like, you know, self-trust can also be considered a lot of inner child work, right? At the end of the day, like building self-trust is really telling like your inner child, like, 
you are safe and I am going to keep you safe throughout whatever challenges come up in my life. I love this advice of celebrate the journey and not just the finish line. It's um, in keeping your inner child safe. That's, that's, that's very powerful. Um, final question would be just curious, do you feel all companies would benefit from inclusivity and DNI efforts? And if you come across companies or folks who are just like poo-poo about it? So there's a big backlash right now, right? When it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, and I'm not going to get into kind of the politics of that. I think there was a lot of ways inclusion was done as a check mark. And as DEI in general was really done as just kind of a check mark, like, look, I'm doing these things, but like, there wasn't real progress being made. And so I think now there's a big backlash of like, oh, hey, all this money was invested and all these things, but nothing really happened. And it's like, yeah, well, you weren't really doing it in, a, in an effective way either. So not surprising progress didn't get made. I think focusing like really on the inclusion piece, like even if you don't like I'm going to put a pin on the diversity piece, even though there is research that shows that having more diverse organizations produce better products and all of these things. Right. I'm going to put a pin in that for now. Any company can value with creating a more inclusive culture because then you are getting the best out of each and every one of your employees because you are really creating an environment where everybody feels safe speaking up and sharing their ideas and inclusion and high performance have been directly tied to each other. You said we were measuring the wrong thing. What could we measure if we're gold on inclusion? And I think it's so inclusion is harder to measure, right? So we were, so, we were, we were very focused on like, okay, did we do like a DEI initiative, right? Did we do our uh, unconscious bias training, right? Did we, did we hire X amount from like whatever pools we were trying to hire? But then we weren't measuring inclusion, which is really harder to measure because there it's really evaluating metrics like, does every person in your company feel safe speaking up? Is everybody's opinion really being valued and heard? And a lot of ways that you gather this is from the more, you know, qualitative data from things like surveys, but you can do surveys over time and actually see the impact that this is having on your company. So it's not like there is no ways to measure this. I think it's, easier to measure the diversity side. So that was really where all the focus was, or just saying like, Oh, hey, I started an employee resource group, I checked that checkbox. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, yes, you started an ERG, but you made your diverse employees be the ones to run it. And then you gave them no authority. And so they burnt out, they, they weren't rewarded for it or recognized for their efforts. And so it died six months to a year later, or nothing came out of it. And it's like, yeah, if you're not setting up the initiatives you create for success, like, you can't expect people to be making miracles out of these things, right? And so I think it's really about looking at like, if you want to do this, and if you care, like being intentional about it and realizing that it is usually the sum of those little things when it comes to inclusion, right? Like, are your meetings inclusive? Like something that people are doing each and every day, like, do people feel safe saying no? Do people feel safe disagreeing? Right. And then, like I said, it really starts with the leadership making it a safe space to contribute and it recognizing other people's contributions. Who should reach out to you and where can they find you? Yeah, so the, the best place to find me is either on LinkedIn or on my website, which is josiehaines.com. And, you know, I love talking to both women in tech leadership who are really looking to architect a career that they love. Um, and I also love working with tech companies, right? Creating workshops or, or coaching programs or group programs to really help retain 
they're, they're women and both are women engineers or they're women leaders, right? And really creating that space where we can be getting these more inclusive cultures. Lovely, Josie. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was great doing this. Thank you for having me.